Laughter is very interesting because it's a very widespread human behaviour um, and there's very, very little research into it. So if I go on to one of the databases for academic papers like Web of Science and I put in the search terms emotion, expression, fear, I get back about 4,000 papers. There are loads of papers looking at how fear is recognised and what fear does. If I put in the term emotion, expression, laughter, I get back about 135 papers. And most of those are academic papers describing clinical problems where people have pathological laughter. There are very, very few academic sort of experimental studies of laughter. And it's a very interesting behaviour because it, we haven't looked at it academically, there's just not much, not much interest in it. But actually it's everywhere, people laugh very, very frequently. And Robert Provine, working in the US, has found that people, if you ask people when do you laugh, what do you laugh at, they talk about jokes and humour and comedy. If you look at people, what you find is they laugh when they're with other people, it's a social behaviour. So. Most laughter actually is not found at humour per se, it's found in conversations, it happens when people are talking to each other. And in fact, he's even found within those conversations, most of the laughter is still not at jokes. People laugh at comments and statements like, I'll have another cup of coffee or I might miss my bus. And in fact, at any one time, he's found that the person who laughs most is normally the person who's speaking. It's part of their communicative act. So it's very interesting, it's kind of everything we think it's not. We think it's about jokes and humour, but actually it's a social behaviour. And when we're talking to somebody and we laugh with someone we're talking to, we're showing them that we, we like them, we show them that we, under, we, we understand them, we agree with them, we're part of the same social group as them. You're doing all this kind of like affiliative social work with laughter in the middle of speech and language. You kind of interleave this non-verbal vocal behaviour because laughter is part of a class of vocalisations like screaming and um, uh, making disgusted sounds, which are more like animal calls than they are like speech. So you're kind of flipping into this animal call behaviour in the middle of human speech. So it's very unusual and quite strange like that and very, very common. One of the other findings is that people consistently underestimate how often they laugh. If you ask people how often you laugh, they will say, give you a number, and you actually then go out and watch them, they laugh all the time. They, they, laugh mu they always laugh more than they think they do. And it's so strongly driven by social context, you get a 30 times more likely to laugh if there is somebody else with you than if you're on your own. So it's really strongly driven by social phenomena. So it's, I find it a very interesting behaviour because I've been studying speech for years and years and years and I've looked at perception, I've looked at production and I've completely separately been looking at these emotional vocalisations like screams and yuck sounds and cheers. And Within that, I started to look more at laughter because I was interested in, in sort of positive emotions. And then as soon as you start looking at that, you realise it's everywhere. And people don't scream very often, but actually they laugh a lot. So it is a very, very interesting behaviour. And it does seem to be something that has, for example, a lot of that behaviour you learn. So one of the phenomena with laughter is it's contagious. So you are very likely, particularly if you know somebody, to catch a laugh from them, even if you don't know why they're laughing. So if your friend starts laughing, you'll probably start laughing, even if you don't know why they're laughing. And that behavioural contagion is something you learn to do. Babies don't laugh contagiously. Babies learn. We teach babies to laugh when other people laugh. That's not specific to laughter, that's also true for yawning. There's a whole set of behavioural contagious things we do that are sort of affiliative. They're basically showing familiarity. You do it with people you know rather than people you don't know. But that's there for laughter and we hardly notice it. We, we just think... You know, we, we're laughing with our friends. We don't never think, well, I don't know why they're laughing, but I am also laughing. So my work on this, for a long time, I was working on vocal expressions of emotion and I was working on negative emotions because that's what we study. You know, we study things like fear and anger and disgust. And I got very interested in why this was the case. I was interested in why everything we studied in, in psychology and neuroscience, when we talk about emotion, pretty much it, without exception, we mean negative emotions. And I started to look into it and people had made claims that there would be, you know, there might be important positive emotions that we should look at. So I started looking at them and I was looking at how they're expressed with the voice because I work with voices. And that's when laughter started to look quite different. So, for example, we did a cross-cultural study looking at which, which emotions are recognised from the voice 
in cultures that have never encountered a, you know, a European person making noises at them. Uh, my PhD student went off to work with the Himba in northern Namibia. What she found was, as has been shown from the face, people in completely different cultures can recognise the emotions of fear, anger, disgust, sadness and surprise. All the other work's been done with the face and she was doing it with the voice, so people in the middle of the Namibian desert, if they hear a sobbing sound, they know what that means. The, she also tested positive emotions and the only positive emotion which was recognised cross-culturally, so the people in the middle of the Namibian desert recognised it, and when we recorded them, people back in the UK recognised that also, was laughter. So laughter really is a universal vocal signal of an emotion. It, it means it might be used differently in different cultures, because that's what humans do, but the basic recognition is there. People know about laughter and they know it when they hear it. It has the same basic meaning. In terms of brain activation, laughter is also very interesting. So I mentioned that laughter is very contagious and you can actually see that if you scan people listening to laughter. You can see the brain getting ready to join in in a way that people don't if they hear a disgusted sound like ugh which is emotionally meaningful, but it's not behaviourally contagious, you don't join in with it. So you can actually see that happening, and in fact, what we found is that across people, the more people show this kind of contagion effect when they listen to laughter, the better they are at working out what laughter means. So if we play them a recording of somebody laughing spontaneously or faking their laughter, the people who show a stronger contagion response in their brain are better at spotting that difference. So it's not just contagion, there's a sort of getting ready to join in with laughter helps you understand what laughter means. So there's a, almost an, an emotional intelligence component to this. So this is something we're very interested in. We're very interested in these individual differences in laughter and how that might relate to experience and also brain function. So we've worked, for example, with um, children with conduct disorders who do show a different neural response to the contagion effects in laughter and we've done some behavioural work with people with depression who find laughter a lot less contagious than people who aren't depressed. So it's a very, it's a very interesting tool because it's a social emotion, you find it in interactions, it lets us map between the social world and the emotional world which normally we kind of treat as somewhat differently, but actually laughter sits squarely in the middle. And it's also very, very commonly encountered. So if somebody has an unusual reaction to laughter in conversations, what effect does that have on the whole interaction? If they don't join in when they hear laughter, or if they find laughter irritating or upsetting, how does that affect what then goes on? So there's a lot more to know. But I'm very interested in it as an emotional and as a social signal. And it does seem to recruit quite different brain networks from, say, other emotional sounds. One of the interesting things about laughter is that we are not the only animals that laugh. So laughter has actually been described in other apes, but it's even been described in rats. And it's probably more of it out there. It's just that no one's really been looking for it. And very interestingly, if you're a human or an ape or a rat, you first see laughter emerging in the same context, which is when babies are tickled by adults, normally their parents. And you don't see that happening, but laughter doesn't sort of emerge on its own, it happens in these interactions. So it's in earliest emergence, laughter is essentially a social bonding phenomenon. And as we get older, it becomes associated with play. So rats laugh when they play, and chimpanzees laugh when they play, and humans laugh when they play. So and that's a huge aspect of um, development for juvenile mammals, so a, play is incredibly important. And then it's got this ris rich social life for adult humans. But interestingly, adult humans have got two different sorts of laugh. Adult humans laugh differently if they're laughing really helplessly, spontaneously, than if they're laughing in conversation, which is very controlled, voluntary laughter. They sound different and people know what they mean, they know they mean different things. Interestingly, chimpanzees do the exact same thing. Chimpanzees have two different laughs. They laugh differently if they're being tickled than if they're trying to make play last longer. So that really does look a lot like the human sort of social laughter versus the human spontaneous laughter. So actually, the parallels with apes might be really quite close. So the, the kind of interaction that you're having with somebody does affect how laughter works. And there was quite an interesting study a few years ago showing people having conversations. They were just having conversational interactions and they either did it face to face 
in the room with each other or face to face but they were on a like a FaceTime or Skype they were on a, there was a screen involved or they were talking on the phone or they were having text messages and what they found was people talked for longer laughed more and were happier afterwards when they'd had the face to face interaction whether or not the person was in the room with them so they laughed as much talked for as long and were ha as happy afterwards if they'd had a screen based conversation but if they can see and hear the person and it's happening in real time that's when you get most laughter if you go down to just the voice there's less laughter because you've lost all the facial information I think and then when you go down to words just words on a screen that's when you get least laughter and that's probably because you're just taking away more and more social information and very interestingly if you look at how people interact with words like on their, their phones or on Twitter or whatever people try and put laughter back in they use smiley faces they use exclamation points they use lol or ruffle or rufflecopter this whole kind of world of different sounds no, sorry this whole kind of world of different visual indications that they're really laughing because you can't hear or see the laughter but you try and put it back in there I think probably the future is everything in that we hardly know anything about laughter we've just done so little work on it, it there's a great deal more to understand we re one of the things I'd really like to understand is how the neural control of laughter works when you're actually producing it how is that different if you're laughing helplessly and you can't stop than if you're laughing politely in a conversation how, how is that working? How is that interleaved with normal, the control of speech? I think it's going to be very important to understand how laughter relates to development. So we know from the rat literature that the more a rat is tickled when it's a baby, the more it will laugh when it's tickled as an adult. So can we see anything like that in humans? Can we see this potentiation? And of course, although laughter is cross-culturally recognised, it is used differently in different cultures. So people can find British people smile too much, for example, or laugh too much in certain cultures. And British people can find me a bit kind of all at sea, like, why, why do people think I'm silly because I'm laughing all the time? And other, pe other cultures, it's extremely impolite to laugh. So actually, these kind of, how does that, does it affect how people process laughter? And is it, or is it just the kind of like a display rule about where you do and don't do this behaviour? So I've emphasised the fact that you find laughter everywhere and all human cultures use laughter, but actually how they use it can, can be very different.